Welcome back to the Ladakh Literature Festival 2020. Our session for today is The Frozen River Seeking Silence in the Himalayas, a conversation between James Crowden and Omer Lasu. In 1976, he traveled to Ladakh after quitting the army, mesmerized and intrigued by the people of this isolated region and how they survived the harsh winters. James Crowden returned to spend the winter of 76 to 77 in Zanskar, landlocked and completely cut off from the rest of the region. A freelance writer and filmmaker, Omer is an advertising and PR graduate from IIMC in Delhi, having worked at LNK Saatchi and Saatchi, amongst others. An avid sportsman, he also works as an MC on occasion. Join our conversation with James Crowden, who worked on the Chadar, the Frozen River, from Padam to Leh and back in January 77. Hi James, hello. Hello, hello, you are a COVID survivor. <laughs> yeah, fortunately or unfortunately I am. I'm, I'm still in isolation and it's kind of been, it's been like two weeks now. So I'm going to be a free man soon though. Free man, oh yes. Yeah, yeah. Free man, you know. Some people would like the idea of doing a retreat for two weeks. You know, you'll come out totally enlightened. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I, I feel a little wiser. I don't know it's, if it's the constricted space that you're living in. Ah, yes. But, uh, you know, going to your book, Frozen, your book, Frozen River, you traveled all the way from England to India and even in India to a remote part like Ladakh and even in Ladakh to the remotest region of Zamskar in 1976. So I want to know what was the motivation behind coming down here, you know, to Z Ladakh and to Zamskar and so early on when Ladakh had just opened for tourists. Well, it's, I just followed my own instinct. In 1974, I had been in Afghanistan in very remote parts of the Hindu Kush, and in I've been in Badakhshan in Nuristan, and that journey opened my eyes to the power of the silence in the mountains. And in the last valley, I walked for three or four over three or four major passes, and the snow came down. We had two porters carrying some of our stuff, and they deserted. We paid them. I was with one other chap, a friend of mine, who was a um, civil engineering student from Bristol, and then had to walk for a day or two in the snow, finding our own way across remote passes. And this became um, very interesting. I thought this is this is um, the sort of thing we don't get in England, although I have been in snow caves in Scotland, which is where John Kay lives. Mm -hmm. And I, it was an opportunity not to be missed when I heard that Ladakh and even Zanskar had suddenly opened in autumn, October, I think it was, 1974. Mm -hmm. And I, I looked at the maps in the Royal Geographical Society with a very famous mountaineer called Eric Shipton, who'd been in Ladakh and in Kashgar. And he looked at the maps and he looked up at me and he said, we didn't even know that valley was there. Yes, uh, yes, right. And, and that was enough to set me on the train of even giving up what might have been quite a successful army career, I thought, actually, it's mountains. I'd much rather be in the mountains than um, uh, chasing people in different places. Right. So as I went through your book, uh, and I must say it has a very poignant spiritual tinge to it. You know, you talk a lot about the language of the mountains, solitude, silence, and snow. So, and you, you also mentioned in the book that you were, I think, reading as well as carrying a copy of Walden by the wall, you know? So, you know, it's, it has a lot of, a very deep spiritual angle as well, almost something that you wrote for yourself, you know? Maybe it was not supposed to be a book. I don't know. Could you? I, it, yes, I could have written it. I, a lot of the notes were made in um, 1980, 79, 80. And 
Curiously enough, the army had posted me to Canada in 1973, and I had taken a trip down to uh, Massachusetts, and actually I visited Walden and the museum, and I slept beside the pond, so I'd become interested. My father had a very old copy of Walden, so Walden was part of our growing up, and it seemed a logical extension to go into the mountains and spend time, not totally on my own, and even, even Thoreau wasn't actually on his own. He lived in a hut, but he was still in communication with people who lived um, near his town of Concord, Massachusetts. So it was a similar thing. It was a Himalayan version, and only for one year, not two years. And it seemed, I think you're right, I think it was more of an internal book. At the same time, I was also in touch with um, a tutor, a tutor at Oxford, who was then became in charge of the Pitt Rivers Museum, and he was fascinated by um, the culture in Afghanistan, and he gave me support he, you know, about the anthropology side of it and the opportunity to study the effect of the road being built into Zanskar, let alone any winter mountaineering or going down the Chadha. So there were three or four different reasons, as well as my own personal reasons. All right, great. Uh, so can you can you tell us a little bit about your journey because you had come to Ladakh earlier in the summer mm -hmm. before you went back home and came back so you know that again is a sort of drastic step that you took um, drastic maybe <laughs> um, I came it was absolutely wonderful I came with a, a good friend of mine who was a mountaineering companion um, called Fiona Lumsden her father had been in Tibet in the 1930s. And mm -hmm. her best friend's father had been DC in late 1939. So I was able to talk to people um, who knew Ladakh from an, an, an earlier time. And then to walk from, in fact, we walked from Sanku, um, because the road from there into Padum with a caravan of 80 or 90 horses, which were carrying salt, in fact. It was the government caravan. Mm -hmm. And this then, um, gave you a wonderful, it was a 10-day journey, and that was magnificent, and walking behind the caravan, and then we walked down to, over the Shingola to Dacha, and that was such a good introduction to the beauty of the mountains, I couldn't keep away. Right, so, uh, you know, after that you came back, and you took this enormous journey, can you, can you mention the challenges, and, you know, the kind of preparation that went into it, and you know, how long it took for you to get there eventually. Well, I was in... you came in pretty late in the summer, you know, you, you were crossing November. in November, right? Yeah. Um, and I was aware that the pass could close in September. So I was taking, many of the horsemen did not want to make the journey. It took two or three days in Panika to persuade the horsemen to go. And they said, well, you'll have to pay double because we're doing one journey. But I was quite happy to do that. Um, but it took their wives, didn't want to let them go. But the moment I handed the money over to the horsemen, their wives took the money from them. <laughs> and, yeah, and you actually have, have calculated the amount and mentioned it in the book. It was 1,600 rupees. Absolutely. The exchange rate was actually only 14 or 15. Yes, um, you paid them above the government. Right, but it was still worth it. Um, but there were all sorts of problems on the way, um, which they, um, some were real, some were imagined. But it was a very lonely but fascinating time of year to go into the mountains when the snow could have come down. I even had to write a piece of paper saying that if their horses were trapped in the valley, I would pay for their fodder for six months, which I knew I couldn't do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. I think it's not mentioned in the book. No, no, no. I was all sorts of other things which uh, had to be involved. <laughs> All right, right. Good. Right. So, um, and then you got to, obviously, you got to Zangskar, you settled in. Can you mention your first impressions? Did you, Although you had been there, but this was slightly in the winter. And what were your impressions, and how did you come to settle down? Because the, you were in there for a long haul. Yes, I planned on coming back. I'd reserved a room in a house, actually a Muslim house, a man called Gulam Sabah. And um, when I got there, there'd been a slight problem with a disturbance there. So there were several policemen living in the rooms. <laughs> I had to spare the night for the first two nights with um, several policemen, but that was okay. One of whom was a, a wonderful Patan from Leh called Bashi Balan. He was um, um, 
his, he was a Pathan who had got trapped in, in a partition. He got trapped this side of the line. And he was a great joker. Um, <laughs> and one story was that he even put a white coat on, went down the hospital and pretended he was a doctor for about three hours. <laughs> um, he was a very good singer. And he actually played the, played the jerry can. Um, and he actually married a woman from Zanskar and learnt a lot of the songs. So he was a very good singer and performer. So the policemen were interesting as well. And right. Um, so you've been coming and going to Ladakh for almost now 43, 44 years, right? So you yes. And you, you've also been going to Zanskar and you were, you know, the probably the second second foreigner in, you know, Zanskar after the Hungarian linguist? Well, that was to spend the winter there, yes. Nobody was mad enough apart from me to spend the winter there. Um, All right, so only the, to spend a winter in Zanskar, you want to say, right? Yes, Choma de Koros, the um, Hungarian linguist, was there in the 1820s, and he stayed in Zangla and in Poktal, and he had the help of a monk called Sange Ponsok, and he was translating the Kangyur at the same time he was compiling a Tibetan English dictionary and was really the first Tibetan scholar. So um, Zanskar and it's an important place from that point of view as well. Right. Uh, you saw a lot of developments, you know, you went while you were there, this, this, the, you saw the two police jeeps that came in, which were possibly the first cars, motor vehicles to come to Zanskar, right? Yes, yes, they were. I remember them coming and there was this strange, people in the village didn't know what was happening. They went on their rooftops and there was just this, this dust cloud. They had no idea what it was. And because of the frozen river, the road wasn't finished, but they managed, they came down into Padum with the, um, with the SDM, the subdivisional magistrate, and um, they re-established the police radio. It was, um, no, it was interesting to see the first vehicles there. And now there are many trucks, buses. Um, I, I even saw a helicopter come. <laughs> so what do you make of all this, all the, all the, the, all these developments that have happened over the years? You know, the, you were primarily going in to record or, you know, see the effects of the road coming into Zanskar, if I'm... I, I think there's, there's good, good things and bad things. I think Maybe it's, it's not black and white at all. I think that the economy needed to change. Um, one thing that worries me is that they are not, they're more interested in business than agriculture. And I think that the agriculture, the number of animals being kept is less than it was. Um, and I think Patom is now a town. Um, it's moved. The old, what saddens me maybe is that the old center of Padum, where all the old houses were, that's almost been abandoned. And there are a lot of other, it's just the way that development happens. I think that they want to feel part of the modern world. Um, I think that, um, you know, there are many different attractions. Some of the tourism, I think, is good because it keeps local Zanskaris in the valley in the summer and they can earn enough money um, to stay there. Whereas before, they always had to leave and get a job in, you know, in Ley or in the Ladakh Scouts. Um, so I think there are they're interesting. Some of the trade routes have stopped, which is a shame, but maybe they were always very hard. Um, like the goats or the sheep coming down from Sokar with the salt. That was quite a sight to see a thousand sheep and goats come down with little saddlebags. But maybe that is a romantic view. Um, one of the, one of the, um, one of the uh, Changpa who came, he asked me, how far is your country? And I really thought set miles I said I worked it out roughly and I said it's about two years walk and he said hmm, is the grazing any good <laughs> like, <laughs> that's grazing any good so that's all it wants to know was what's the grazing any good and how long did it take to get there <laughs> Which is yeah. very right so you spent a lot of time with the community in Zanskar you know you had a lot of acquaintance you made a lot of friends you know and a lot of relationships and uh, you know the, you were you uh, you were part of the community so to say and then and you took that charter trek with with people from Zanskar to lay and back can you can you tell us start a little bit about your experience on the charter and all the challenges that you faced well charter was um 
was interesting. I went with a young lad called Sanam Stokies, um, who was from Padum, and he hadn't done the chatter before, but his uncle, Doje Sering, um, he had, he'd done it many times. And his uncle, um, he was one of those at the wedding ceremonies, he, um, he knew all the songs for the, on the Gesser epic. So he was a very intelligent man. He could remember everything. He was our guide, and and he also spoke English, by the way. I think he he was. Sonam Stokis, yes, there were two people who spoke English. There was Sonam Stokis and Ponchok Dawa, who was the teacher. He's now the Kepo in Padum. They spoke good English. Otherwise, it would have been very difficult for me. Um, it's, but I was more interested in, in in the photography, in just absorbing the atmosphere of the place. But Sonam Stokis was very good. He stayed in Ley. Um, the journey was hard, there's no doubt about it, and we had to be very careful. In places it was very dangerous, but you just have to take care with the ice. And you know, you can't be too you have to be confident. I think that's the main thing, and respect the ice and respect the cold and respect the winter. All right. And you also had a little incident, I think one of while coming back. Uh while in Lay, actually, you also met the DC. And finally, he took, uh, you know, got a haircut. When yes, did got, yes, I got a haircut. I met Tashi Rabkis as well. The DC was very good. He gave me a cup of coffee. He was, they were interested to know what this mad Englishman was doing up in Saskatchewan. <laughs> and they decided I wasn't doing any harm, so they let me go back again, um, which was good. That was um, Saeed Rizvi and his wife Janet has written several books. Very knowledgeable, very lovely couple of great love for Ladakh. Right. I, I just want to share the screen a little bit and um, show you from the from your time um, during the charter. I, I suppose this is you during the charter and it's an epic picture that I want to show everyone. Uh, 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 I think you can see my screen, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there you are. This is you, right? Yes, you are. You are right. I needed a haircut. Yes. <laughs> okay. This is this is pretty epic. I mean, this this one's you yeah. almost this yes. cross on your mustache, you know? Yes. Yes. I don't. I don't normally have a beard, but I realised that shaving was a bit of a problem when there is no water <laughs> uh, or no warm water. But yes, it was like minus 30 and the ice often gave out and we were climbing along the wall. That's an avalanche cone. Sometimes, you know, if you're trapped in there when an avalanche comes, you've, you've got problems and people do have died because of avalanches um, on, in the Chador. And we saw snow leopard tracks. Um, there are many. That is the view. This is this is the this is a picture that you uh, you know you, if you could tell us something about this picture. Because when I was with um, my good friend Fiona Lumsden in the summer, we climbed the mountain. It's not a very high peak, but it took two or three days to climb it behind Padok, and that is the mm -hmm. view at the top, looking south into Kishwar. And none of those peaks would have been climbed, and it was just a magnificent view, and you got a sense of the scale and the power out of the silence of the mountains and when we looked the other way we could see into the Karakoram and see K2 very clearly so it was a very interesting way to understand how Zanskar really is trapped in the middle of those um, phenomenally beautiful mountains. Right, uh, we'll go through a couple, a couple more pictures from your trip and maybe you could, you know, you could tell us a little bit about them. But in this Zujula uh, well, uh, that... Yeah, this is interesting because the Zujula, I think, has changed. And you can see the military road that's been built up there. And the, but no, no, that's the military road, but it's very prone to avalanches in those nullas. And sometimes in the old days, um, the caravans below, you can just make out the old route, which was, yeah. that was the caravan route, which was very famous, but also very dangerous. Um, and my great uncle had tried to get up there in 1942 because he wanted to see the paintings in Alchi. Um, he ended up being a professor of Indian archaeology, but he was desperate to see them, but he couldn't because the avalanche danger, he was walking, they walked at night um, and they were up to their, almost up to their waists in powder snow. So it was 
quite late in the year, so it was dangerous. He didn't see it. Um, and on the far right, you can see the telephone line, just a few telephone poles. Yeah, and yeah, right, right. That, it was the only communication <laughs> apart from army radios. Um, that was the one line down to Srinagar from Dras and Kargil. Um, so communications were, once that pass was closed, that was it. Right. So um, a very huge influence on you as a person was your uncle Kenny, right? And as a kid, I think he gave you a tour of the British Museum, wherein you were, that was when, for the first time, you were exposed to things related to Tibetan Buddhism and from the, you know, the subcontinent here. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about him and your, you know, how you got uh, interested in spirituality, in Ladakh, in, you know, in ancient Buddhism, so on and so forth? Ah, that's a big question. <laughs> right. He was a fascinating man. His family had been in the Indian Army for over 150 years. Um, but he was born himself in Murray, which is now in, in Pakistan, um, like a hill station. And he then spent his time in India. He spoke many Indian languages. He came back and um, he joined the Indian Army. Um, he ended up going to Oxford uh, and Cambridge. But he ended up at the... At the Victorian Albert Museum in London as keeper of the Indian section, which was very interesting. So he then um, was always dealing with Indians, Indian politics, um, and also he had an extraordinary experience in Simla in um, 1910 or 1911 when he saw the 13th Dalai Lama, um, who was in disguise as a Tibetan salt trader, and this left a deep impression on him. And he was always in the British Museum. He took me around, showed me all the Buddhist sculptures. And he said the most interesting thing was not what they knew, but what they did not know. And that left an interesting, um, interesting part in my psychology that actually it's what you don't know that was more important than what you did know. Yeah, so what an absolutely amazing individual. I mean, you know, I, I'm sure he inspired you in many ways. And... You know, he also himself took a trip to Zuzila, like you mentioned before. Yeah, yeah. He also translated Sufi poetry, and he was fluent in Afghanistan. He was it was interesting. Um, he he was right. um, multilingual. So yes, I learned a lot from him. Right, and so over the years, you've seen a lot of you know you in the later part of your book, you also mentioned about uh, the road finally being in Zanskar and. You know, so you've seen a sort of environmental degradation or loss of culture or tradition. And then you also had, uh, you know, in, in Zanskar itself. So can you can you tell us a little bit on your you know, obs observations? I went back at the 12 year point. In fact, I took um, I, I went back there and to Zanskar and they were just starting to have tractors and there were four tractors in the valley, I think. Two were Buddhist, one was Muslim owned, and one was jointly owned. And I thought this was a very good, a good step forward. They were hotels were starting, and it was, it was on a small scale. Um, I think that then things, I think Buddhism and tourism are fascinating combination, or the religious tourism, um, because you have to be very eccentric to want to go walking in Zanskar. I think that you get some very big Europeans in Zanskar, and I met some wonderful Europeans in Zanskar who are keen on mountains or one lady last time we went, um, she was responsible for wolves in a part of France. And I said, well, she has to count the wolves. And I said, well, how do you know how many wolves there are? And she just said, I stand on a rock and I go, oh, and see what the <laughs> wolves are. <laughs> so, uh, no, no, there's some, it, and, but the interaction, there's been a lot of, um, I think the, what interests me is there's been quite a lot, I think the, it's the, the snow line has gone up and it is the, um, it is global warming which, which is really affecting, that is the most important problem, which is difficult to address. Um, I know that in one village of Karcha, they only planted 60% of their fields one year, like two years ago and that some villages have moved, they've shifted 30 miles, 
and some villages have a lot less water. Some villages have a lot of water, but that's because the glacier is melting. And one day, um, God will turn the tap off. <laughs> uh, maybe, yeah. I mean, everything... Uh, let's see what happens, but yeah, so there is surely been a loss of, um, you know, in terms of environment, all the, the water, uh, you know, the glaciers moving up. And also, did you see, uh, you know, you went in 76 and then you also went in 2018. Yes. And so, you know, do you see a change in the temperament of the, you know, the, of the local people from what changes did you see? And well, I think some of the um, some of the young, young Sanskaris are just that they're, they're sort of young Indians they they, you know, they will dress in Western clothes. That's normally, but some of the old men, the old people were, um, you know, still like, as, as they, had, they hadn't bothered to change. They were still wearing, I think there's been a, um, a slight, there's a sort of Muslim part of the bazaar and a Buddhist part. And I think it's one thing that makes me sad is that there are, there are, there are these slightly religious divisions, which are maybe more economic and political because sometimes the families are actually related to each other. And I'd love to see a resolution to, some of these problems. Um, but as in Sanskar, they can say, we may have our differences, but when winter comes, um, <laughs> we have to face the same problems. Great, a great, it plays a great leveler, you know, you're, everybody's on the same plane of, on, on that. And also your, um, you know, your uh, story about that shared uh, tractor, I mean, about a Buddhist and a Muslim person owning a tractor together was a very interesting one from the past. Yes, right. I don't know who actually repairs it when it goes wrong, but maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But they still have to keep, even with a tractor, you still have to keep the irrigation channel. So you can only use small tractors. And um, I think, yes, the harvest, it was very, very hard work. I, I don't dispute that. The, you know, the old ways of, I helped them harvest when I was there, just pulling it up, pulling the barley up by the roots is, um, I think quite a lot of topsoil is lost with the wind. Um, I think there are, I think to keep the soil and to keep the agriculture productive and if possible organic is a very important thing. Right, so uh, I, I want to go to towards the end of your book when you were coming back, this was in April and you'd been in Zamskar from November till I think mid-April I suppose? I was still, yes, I was there um, until I came out the very last day of Eight, the last two or three days of April, and then I skied over. Right, so you had a lot of difficulty getting out as well, where you faced starvation almost, you know, well, you were without food for a couple of days. A couple of and days. And the danger of wolves and avalanches. So can you explain, can you tell us more on that? Give us a little... Oh, yeah. <laughs> My rations were getting a bit low. In fact, there wasn't much snow, but in Karsha, they had a special snow puja, and um, it seemed to work, and sure enough, more snow came down. <laughs> um, they, like they needed snow for the glaciers to keep the keep the irrigation channels going the next summer, and I went up the valley and there was a very there was a two day snowstorm and I had to stay in the village in a house um, a man called it's a beda it's a beda amchi he was an amchi and they snow stayed there um, but the they had sheep and goats in a small little pen outside and the wolves came down and took them they killed all of them which was terrifying really for the family. And I hoped it wasn't, I hope they hadn't followed me, um, but I think that the wolves were preying in packs. And then next day I had to go, I couldn't, I, and I skied out following the wolf tracks rather than the wolves following me, I was following them. Then they, after about a mile or two, they went up a side valley. And then avalanches, this was actually, I crossed the Pensola on May the 1st. And if you're in the mountains and it's late afternoon and the snow is starting to melt, that is absolutely not the time to be there. And I missed one big avalanche by only two or three minutes. My, I, you develop a mountain instinct and I thought, I don't like this. Even though I only have cross country skis, I skied downhill for one or 2000 feet and um, that saved me, but that wasn't the end of it. The, I had a choice between skiing on a river that was breaking up or but going under cliffs where there were avalanches coming down. So um, I only just made it to the village of Tashi Tanze, where there was another Amchi. Mm, right. Um, so 
moving on, uh, I want to talk a little bit about your own personal life a little bit and your experience. Because before you were, uh, uh, before you came to Ladakh, you were in the army, which you quit. But you also had some very interesting episodes in um, in Turkey at the, at Mount Arad, where you were, you know, cap- I think apprehended by the militia or something. And you you've had a co- lot of co- close calls. Uh, oh yeah. yeah. So you say you say, say a cat has nine lives. Well, I've used about six of them up before I ever got to Zanskar. <laughs> The army, in their infinite wisdom, had posted me to the wonderfully beautiful island of Cyprus, which has its problems. And But I was able, any leave time, I was able to go into eastern Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan. And I was on Mount Ararat, and we were held up by Kurdish, Kurdish communist bandits who were living over in on the Russian side. And they came across, and they were being... The Turkish army was looking for them, but luckily I was with one other man and his wife, and we were caught just below the snow line at about 14, 15,000 feet, um, probably 14,000 feet. Um, we were caught by them, and they weren't too interested. They wanted a few cigarettes, a bit of money. They wanted to chat to our guides, um, and they were extremely civilized. There were four horses, but then we only saw three men. There was a man, they had early um, 1940 rifles, and... They were interested. They were, it was a Kurdish chief who'd had to flee in the 1960s, and he came back just to see how they was doing. It was a forerunner of the PKK. So that was one incident. And then in Afghanistan, I also, we were held up for two or three days by a man with a revolver who wanted to finish his harvest before he took us. Um, he wanted to have the money being to be the porter, but he, at one point he was cleaned, cleaning his revolver. He actually... Um, deconstructed his revolver so we thought that's the time to nip so we nipped off um <laughs> lucky <laughs> Nuristan was interesting and afghanistan at one time had been very buddhist as most people with the bamiyan buddhas yes yes so could you could you tell us uh, you know your a little more on your you know your uh, research and your you know knowledge on on the ancient buddhist history of kushan and gandhara and how it was linked to ladakh and this is also something that you, you know, you researched about here and, I mean, looked for in Ludak. I, being... I think that it, it's a very big question. I mean, Gandhara was a, there were, there were the Kushans, the various people became Buddhist. Um, at one point, I mean, amazingly, the whole of North India, well, most of North India was Buddhist and there were sites, cities, vast universities like Taksin and Nalanda, and then there were sites like Sanchi. But I wanted to get a real flavour of it. My great uncle had been watching them excavating at Bagram, north of Kabul, in 1940, a French expedition. He knew the French archaeologist very well, Joseph Hakan. He and his wife and um, tragically died. They were torpedoed during the war. So my uncle had to look after his findings and his belongings and make sure they came back to France, which I think they did. Um, but from that point, I could see that Gandhara was this extraordinary interesting intellectual Buddhist spiritual kingdom which then spread into Kashmir and really there's not much left of it in Kashmir um, uh, I think the and that was part of it so you had this great sort of civilization which slowly shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and I think that what we see in Ladakh is the sort of is the last vestiges of it and then it was from there that the second diffusion occurred into Tibet so some of the remains and the, the carvings, I'd like to say maybe the Kanika or Kanishka Chortan at Sunny, these are important things. And the spirituality is like a direct link to ancient Gandhara. Right. Um, and you've also written, I mean, moving on from your, you know, we've discussed your book a little bit. And you've also written a, uh, an, another book on called Chasing Hairs, where you talk about hair iconography in different parts of the world uh could you could you tell us a little more on that well, um, that, yeah absolutely that was really not so much a book it was just a sort of um, an essay online um the other people part did a book but i did a radio four program for the bbc about which involved the the hair the three hairs and even four hairs occur very significantly at alchi um and at basco and also in um, Dunhuang in China. 
and it seemed it was an early Buddhist symbol which was used. It's it's very potent and powerful. We don't know the full meaning of it, but um, it obviously was very important to them. And I think there are hairs around um, a lot of hairs in Western Tibet, and there's a, even a Tibetan hair. And I talked to Tashi Rapkis, um, great yeah. friend John Crooks. Yeah. He said, "Well, they're always they never kill hairs. They are they are holy, and they're like bodhisattvas because they always sit up there looking at you. They're always meditating." He said. <laughs> All right, uh, I think we've come towards the end of the discussion, and uh, I think the last thing I would want to ask you, since you mentioned Tashi Rabgyas, he seemed to be very popular in Zangskar, and you, you had a lot of conversation with people there about that. Yes, well. he, was, um, he was like a folk hero, because they had a very, very bad winter in 1956, I think it was, and very heavy snow came in September before they had harvested the crops, and a lot of the crops were ruined, and that was there was no road, there was no way. They actually starved that winter. A lot of animals died, um, and the government sent in relief. And Tashi Rebkis, as a young man, was sent in to assess the problems and to pay compensation to people for the animals they'd lost. And he was very good-humoured, scrupulously honest, and they loved him. And ever since then, he walks on water in, in Zanskar. And um, he was very much respected. And a friend of mine, John Crook, who did many much research work in Zanskar, he was their interpreter, and he helped understand a lot of what was going on. So his knowledge was um, of great value, um, let alone his Buddhist spirituality and always laughing. Right. Uh, jo uh, James, thank you so much for your time. I think we've come to the end of this interview. and. Thank you so much for your time. A great pleasure, Omar. Thank you.